Ok. Buenas noches a todos y muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos en la conferencia del día de hoy titulada Performance Art and Its Second Life in 1960s Japan, Focusing on Information, a cargo de la doctora Reiko Tomi y organizada en colaboración con el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Monterrey, Marco. Eh, mi nombre es Ileana Rojas y yo soy coordinadora de actividades culturales de la Fundación Japón en México. Antes de cederle la palabra a El Marco, me gustaría darles unos, unos avisos. Para todos nuestros participantes desde la sesión de Zoom, queremos comentarles que esta conferencia cuenta con opción a traducción simultánea. La doctora va a hablar en inglés y eh, pueden escuchar esta conferencia en español. El botón para activar la traducción se encuentra en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Y... Eh, Van a ver un botón que dice interpretación, deben de seleccionar el idioma español y así podrán escuchar a nuestra traductora Lorena Carrillo. Pueden activar o desactivar el botón a su gusto para escuchar la conferencia ya sea en inglés o en español. Por otro lado, tenemos un botón de preguntas, así que si ustedes desean hacer una pregunta a la doctora eh, con respecto a su presentación, le pedimos que lo escriban en esta sección. Si alguna de las preguntas que ya se escribieron les parece interesante, pueden darle like para que le, dam, le demos prioridad a esa pregunta al terminar la sesión. Y finalmente me gustaría pedirles que al finalizar esta conferencia nos apoyen respondiendo la encuesta de satisfacción que les aparecerá automáticamente. Esta encuesta nos ayuda a seguir organizando actividades de su interés. Para todos aquellos que nos estén viendo desde el Facebook Live de la Fundación Japón, la conferencia de la doctora Tommy tendrá una traducción simultánea automática en español. Si ustedes quieren escuchar la ponencia en el idioma original, es decir, en inglés, los invitamos a que nos acompañen en el seminario de Zoom. En los comentarios de la publicación, uno de mis compañeros eh, pondrá la liga para inscribirse al seminario. Y bueno, antes de iniciar la conferencia, me gustaría co comentarles acerca de la agenda que tenemos preparada con la doctora Tommy en próximas semanas. El próximo lunes 14 de marzo a las 16 horas tendremos la conferencia Prueba de Pipeta, de Nuevo Arte, Naikwa y las Galerías de Alquiler en la década de 1960 en Japón en colaboración con el Centro de Estudios de Asia y África del Colmex. En esta conferencia comprenderemos más acerca del fenómeno de las galerías de alquiler y su importancia para el desarrollo de la escena artística japonesa de los años 60. Pueden ver esta conferencia a través de nuestro Facebook. Por otro lado, el martes 15 a las 17 horas no se pierdan una anatomía de la tierra desolada en el arte japonés de la década de 1960. Va a ser una conferencia seguida por una conversación entre la doctora Tommy y los participantes del Seminario Permanente de Investigación de Arte y Cultura México-Japón del Centro Nacional de las Artes. La transmisión también será a través de nuestro Facebook. Finalmente, para cerrar con nuestro ciclo de actividades, el viernes 25 de marzo a las 11 de la mañana tenemos la conferencia Localizando el Colectivismo, un ADN de bricolaje en el arte del siglo XX en Japón en colaboración con el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Querétaro. Esta conferencia hablará de la importancia del colectivismo en el desarrollo del arte japonés del siglo XX. No se la pueden perder, va a estar muy interesante y con esa vamos a cerrar nuestras actividades con la doctora Reiko. Y bueno, finalmente les quiero compartir las redes sociales por si no nos siguen, ahí van a poder ver todas las transmisiones y a finales de marzo podrán encontrar las conferencias subtituladas en nuestro canal de YouTube así como en el de nuestros eh, museos eh, colaboradores. Ahora sí, me gustaría cederle la palabra a Indira Sánchez, gerente de Educación del Marco. Gracias, pues en nombre del Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Monterrey, nos sentimos sumamente honrados de pues, formar parte de esta convocatoria eh, promovida por la Fundación Japón en México, para el museo realmente es un honor poder participar en esta conferencia con la doctora Reiko Tomí, a quien admiramos enormemente eh, aquí en el museo y obviamente entre toda nuestra comunidad cultural. 
Quiero agradecer también a Ileana Rojas, coordinadora de actividades culturales de Fundación Japón, quien promovió esta colaboración entre el Museo Marco y la Fundación, y a Sato Marí, subdirectora de la Fundación. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias, Indira. Ahora eh, le voy a pedir a la subdirectora María Sato que nos dé un breve saludo antes de iniciar. Hola, buenas noches. A nombre de la Fundación Japón de México, es un gran placer darles la bienvenida a todos ustedes en esta conferencia realizada en colaboración con el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo Monterrey. Me gustaría aprovechar la oportunidad de agradecerle a la directora eh, Tayana Pimentel, así como a la gerente de educación Inila Sánchez, por todo su apoyo en la realización y difusión de esta ponencia. Esperamos que nuestra colaboración entre instituciones sea constante para así continuar compartiendo más del arte contemporáneo japonés en el norte de México. Esta potencia forma parte de una serie de actividades que organizamos junto con los museos y centros de investigación más importantes de México para promover el intercambio intelectual en un tema tan fascinante como el arte contemporáneo japonés de la mano de la Kuladola eh, y académica Reikotomi. Propiciar el intercambio intelectual es parte de nuestra misión como fundación. Para aquellos que no conocen a la Fundación Japón, nosotros somos una entidad especial parte del gobierno de Japón que difunde la cultura japonesa, promueve el aprendizaje del idioma japonés y propicia el diálogo. El día de hoy tenemos el honor de que la doctora Reiko Tomi nos hable de arte performático japonés de los años 60 y cómo la documentación de estos actos efímeros les proporciona una segunda vida. En las siguientes sema semanas, la doctora nos acompañará en tres conferencias más en las que se abordarán temas diferentes relacionados a la escena artística radical de los años 60 en Japón. Así que los invito a seguir de cerca la agenda que tenemos preparada para este mes de marzo. Como subdirectora de la Fundación Japón, espero que esta conferencia sea enriquecedora y despierte la curiosidad de los interesados en el arte japonés para sumergirse más en este tema. Disfruten de la presentación. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, María San. Satosan. <ríe> Muy bien, eh, bueno, antes de darle la bienvenida a nuestra ponente que está por acá, me gustaría eh, leerles su semblanza. Reiko Tomi es una académica independiente y curadora especializada en la historia del arte japonés de la posguerra. Después de recibir su PhD en Historia del Arte Estadounidense de Posguerra de la Universidad de Texas en Austin, fue parte del Centro de Arte Contemporáneo Internacional, SICA donde trabajó con el archivo personal de Yayoi Kusama. Tommy colaboró con la curadora Alexandra Monroe en la primera retrospectiva de Yayoi Kusama en los Estados Unidos, así como en la exposición Japanese Art After 1945, Scream Against the Sky, que se centró en la historia del arte japonés posterior a 1945. Después de 1992, como curadora y académica independiente, la doctora Tomi trabajó con el Museo de Queens en Nueva York para la exposición Global Conceptualism, con el Tate Modern de Londres para Century City y con el Getty Research Institute para Art, Anti-Art, Non-Art, entre muchos otros. Su primera monografía Radicalism in the Wilderness, International Contemporaneity and 1960s Art in Japan, fue publicada por MIT Press en 2016. El libro recibió el premio Robert Motherwell Book Award de 2017 y en 2019 se transformó en una exposición del mismo nombre. Eh, su erudición, especialmente su exploración metodológica de la historia del arte mundial y los múltiples modernismos resuena cada vez más entre los académicos que trabajan en otras regiones no occidentales. 
Durante los últimos años, antes de la pandemia, la doctora Tommy ha viajado para dar conferencias en Beijing, Seúl, Singapur y Australia, además de otras ciudades de Estados Unidos y de Europa. En 2020, la doctora recibió el premio del Comisionado de Asuntos Culturales del gobierno japonés por sus contribuciones al intercambio cultural internacional. Y bueno, ahora sí, uh, welcome Tommy Sensei. Thank you so much for your joining us today. So now, now I will leave you the, the stage. Thank you. Uh, I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, let me start my slide. The, the today theme uh, topic is performance art and its second life in 60 Japan, focusing on information. Six is Japan is a paradigmatic site in studying multiple modernism in world art history. In the growing state of international contemporaneity, Kokusai Tekidoji say, vanguard artists in this country that had been long litigated to the margins began to assert their distinct characters in a range of dematerialized practices. Among them was performance art, which indeed dates back to the 20s Japan. In post-war Japan, from the late 50s through the early 70s, vanguard artists contributed a number of experiments and innovations in body-based and time-based practices. Memorable works abound. To just name a few, they range from Gutai's performance paintings to the undocumented act of Kazekura Sho falling down from a chair on which he was seated in the late 50s from Hyred Center's legendary cleaning event in 64 to the praise voyage happening in an egg of 68. From Khan's event to change the image of snow of 1970 to Hikosaka Naoyoshi's Fro event also in 1970. These phenomenal works make us ask a series of questions. How did these works come about? What were their motivations? What were the specific local contexts that shaped their practices? What do they mean? In recent years, these questions have been examined by a number of scholars among them. The indisputable pioneer is Kuro Dalaiji with his voluminous 2010 book, Anarchy of the Body, Undercurrents of Performance Art in 60 Japan, with a particular emphasis on the engagement with the body. Performance art in 60s Japan is a rich, diverse, and evolutionary topic to study. My goal today is to capture less body conscious works and expand our methodological and interpretative framework. To do so, I would like to introduce the notion of second life of a performative and other time-based ephemeral work. When the original manifestation of an ephemeral work disappears in time, we may still have its second life in terms of information, often in the form of documentary photography, but not limited to it. In the early days of post-war performance art, the agency of performative work and the agency of its second life are not always the same. And an artist gave a performance and a photographer photographed it. Who controls the resulting who controls the resulting photography or the second life depends on the relationship between the two, which must be taken into account in our discussion. By foregrounding the second life of performative and other time-based works, we can understand a major operational shift that took place in perform performance art as the expanded 60s unfolded from gutai to anti-art and geijutsu to non-art, Higeijutsu. In 60s Japan, key to understand the origins of performance art is publicity, which is a form of information. Two key practitioners are Gutai in Osaka and Shinohara Ushio in Tokyo. The history of publicity dates back to the mid 50s with Gutai's performance painting. In many instances, 
under the instigation of the leader Yoshihara Jiro to do something that was never done before. Butai artists explore performative acts as picture making strategies. Okay, this is a fun picture, a bonus feature. I actually tried to uh, simulate the, uh, this uh, very violent the, uh, uh, the performance uh, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York at the instigation of a younger, younger artist, A. Arakawa. Performative art served as a catalyst for the exploration of new, new type of painting. This is an intrinsic reading of Gutai's performance painting. Slide on screen is Shiraga's legendary act, challenging, challenge, uh, the challenging mud in 55. In contrast, in an extrinsic operational reading, Shiraga performed challenging mud three times for the press during first Gutai art exhibition in October 55. Performance art and its sec Ah, hold on. Sorry. That is to say, Shiraga's act was only his own picture making exploration, but also served Yoshihara's publicity strategy, quoting the mass media. There were two precedents of publicity that Yoshihara was aware. One was the publicity stance staged in the immediate post-war years by the Salon-based exhibition society Nika, of which Yoshihara was a senior member. Yoshihara was also keenly aware of the famous live article that instantly made Pollock known internationally. With Gutai, photography served dual purpose of purposes of documentation and publicity. Yoshihara had the members self-document their activities while quoting the media's attention. Notably, both documentation and publicity was part of Yoshihara's larger goal of international networking, which was exemplified by the publication of Gutai Journal. Gutai generated and controlled their photos to a greater degree than others in Japan. Slightly later than Gutai's publicity seeking, Shinohara Hoshio pioneered the act of publicity in uh, anti-art. Shinohara's interest in publicity derived from Pollock's European counterpart, Jojo Matsu, who gave public demonstrations of action painting in Tokyo in September 57. Shinohara drew two lessons from this spectacle. First, he came to recognize the power of Matthew's showmanship and publicity. Second, he nonetheless thought Matthew too slow and too conscious of composition. Shinohara distilled these lessons into two mottos. Be speedy, beautiful, and rhythmical in terms of expression. Exploit the mass media for publicity in terms of operation. He embraced publicity, seeking reward in the otherwise rewardless avant-garde life. He once wrote, the spiritual freedom that arises from the rewardless act, musho no koi, of gadgets is nothing but the thing of the past. In front of an interviewer's microphone, he who loudly says something shocking wins. In front of a camera, he must not hesitate but start dancing naked. Critiquing the modern idea of art for the sake of art, Shinohara regarded art as part of social exchange. It should be remembered that his idea of publicity as reward was closely tied to the local situation. That is to say, there existed particularly no commercial market for vanguard art in Japan at the time. With no market, vanguard artists could not possibly garner much financial reward from their work. Indeed, Shinohara lived in the reality of starving artists. That is why, even though he created a magnificent boxing painting in front of the camera, including that of William Klein, the American uh, photographer, he at the time upheld the principle of action for the sake of action, 
seemingly indifferent to preserving any of his masterpieces. His economic reality was harsh. Shinohara was so poor that he could not afford to buy canvas and an expensive art supply. So he used craft paper pasted on the concrete fence. He boxed with cheap bottled sumi ink. Instead of using expensive boxing gloves, he rubbed his fist with drug. From the beginning, he had no means to create a work that could be preserved. But Shinohara was fortunate to have sympathetic photojournalists who served as liaison to the mass media, the principal benefactors who enable Shinohara to gain publicity as a reward. A number of photographers followed Shinohara's and others who breached the boundary of art and life, going into the streets and other unorthodox venues to stage their acts. Among them, two photographers, Hirata Minoru and Hanaga Mitsutoshi stand out in terms of their enthusiasm and their ingenuity as published mediators. As such, they functioned as powerful agents of information for anti-art practitioners. Hirata Minoru became familiar with the avant-garde scenes of Tokyo through Shinohara after meeting him in 58 on assignment from a new news agency. Hirata went on to photograph what he calls art in action of 60 Japan as demonstrated by the memorable images captured by him. The other photojournalist was Hanaga Mitsutoshi. Handicapped with a bad knee, Hanaga directed his camera to the socially oppressed and the uh, underprivileged. His engagement with the underground art and culture was informed by his sympathy toward the marginalized. In 1964, when Hyrule Center staged closing event at Nika Gallery in 64, the group literally closed the gallery for the duration of their exhibition. Hanaga shot the portrait of cockroach, which served as a sole witness of the gallery closing from within. Hanaga also followed the iconic scene of Zero Dimensions back naked gas mask walking ritual in 67. Between two of them, Hirata consciously made a more proactive contribution in terms of publicity for anti-art. He sometimes brought a female model so that the artist may interact with her. In this scene, Shinohara used a fire extinguisher filled with sumi ink to splash paint both on the model and the environment. Sometimes scenes were staged specifically for Hirata's camera. For example, Yoko Ono gave pro private performance for him in the summer of 64. At Shonan Beach near Kamakura, she made a few seemingly impromptu poses using liquor bottles. With her then husband, Anthony Cox, she also performed back piece on the rooftop of her apartment in Shibuya for Hirata. And after Hirata captured Ono's legendary cut piece at Sogetsu Kaikan in Tokyo in her farewell concert in August 64, he successfully pitched an article idea for Shukan Taishu and got her three-page opening feature. His article included color photos of her family portrait and back piece. With this intervention, we are compelled to ask, whose work is it? Generally speaking, Artists were happy to get their performative practices photographed and documented by photographers, but they were also dismayed that they did not always have ownership of these photographs. Although the relationship between the photographer and the photograph in performance art is sometimes contentious, there is no ambiguity regarding which comes first. Even though a performative work may be lost in history without a photographer's involvement, a photographer cannot shoot without an artist's act. If we apply a symbiotic view of the two through documentation, the photographer affords the second life of the artist 
ephemeral art, which decidedly constitute the first life of the artist's work. The second life can then acquire an enduring place in history. This is a symbiotic view. Hirata's work makes a fascinating case. Above all, Hirata exercised a superb camera eye to not just record, but memorialize art in action through such iconic images as Hyred Center's cleaning event. Furthermore, he promoted art in action in the mass print media as a photojournalist, acting as an intermediary between artists and society and thereby enabling a larger exposure of their art as social event. In this sense, the word Hirata garnered double, the, in this sense, Hirata generated double reward for his artist friend. One reward is immediately given in the form of publicity, while the other is potentially enduring and trusted to history. Hirata himself defines his place in relation to these uh, practitioners as a conspirator. As such, indeed, he was a proactive and collaborative conspirator, embodying a symbiotic model of historical agency in performance art. The 60s was a formative decade of performance art in Japan and elsewhere in the world, when few conventions were in place to normalize and legitimize performative practice as part of art history. Toward the late 60s, the situation began to change with no art or higeijutsu. In expression, no art can be characterized by critique of making and the institution of art, bijutsu, as embodied by conceptualism, monoha, and collectivist practices. No art is a Japanese term for the dematerializing state of art. In operation, no art arose against the background of the increasing transmutation of avant-garde, zenyei, into contemporary art, gendai bijutsu, and the mainstreaming of contemporary art within the art establishment. Although the commercial market was still meager, some artists were beginning to gain gallery affiliations, such as Takamatsu Jiro and Monohazu Sekine Nobuo. With the institutionalization, other kind of marketplace became more realistic as well, including exhibitions at two national museum of modern art at Tokyo and Kyoto, as well as the Mainichi newspaper companies, domestic and international biennials, the latter known as Tokyo Biennale. There were also other major competitive exhibitions as Nagaoka Contemporary Art Prize Exhibition and Suma Outdoor Sculpture Exhibition. Are, these were relatively regulated spaces of the institutions for contemporary art. Outside the institutional realm, two significant sites can be observed in performance art during this period. One was the street imbued with a more activist spirit. The other is the wilderness as an extra institutional realm. In the late 60s, street actions took an extreme form when the subversive intent in the art sphere conflicted with the radical politics of the anti-war and student movement of late 60s. The most notorious was anti-expo joint struggle group, which included a number of ritualist collectives such as Zero Dimension, and Kurohata, meaning Black Frog, who vehemently opposed the forthcoming Expo 70 as a state corporate, uh, state corporate, uh, corporate festivity. In essence, this is a politicized extension of anti-art in the late 60s. This direction formed the realm of out of bound, both in spirit and practice. These on the street practitioners disregarded any possible relationship with the mainstream art world. Instead, what I call the wilderness emerged as a new space for no art, as part of contemporary art. In its literal meaning, the wilderness denotes 
remote landscape, as discussed in my recent book, in which I examined three artists, including their performative works. In the context of the increasing institu institutionalization of contemporary art in 60s Japan, the wilderness has multiple layers of meaning in understanding the state of new art that emerged in outside of Tokyo. In the context of the increasingly mainstreaming new art, two realms, the institutionalized space and the wilderness complemented each other. Either one missing, our understanding will be incomplete. In both the institutional and wilderness context, one of major engines was conceptualism, which shifted the emphasis in performance art from the dominant physical presence of the body in anti-art to the more idea-based strategies. One of the characteristics of conceptualism in Japan was the conscious use of photography by artists themselves as their medium or tool. This initially happened not in performance art per se, but with artists who observe things perform, so to speak, and turn the information in the form of photography into their work. Among the very first Japanese artists to adapt photography as a primary means of inquiry was Nomura Hitoshi, who was trained in sculpture. His initial interest centered on the changing state of matter through which he sculpted time. The first work in which he explored time was Tardy Orogy, a huge collapsing cardboard box tower, cardboard, cardboard box tower of 68-69. Photographing its collapse to document his work, he came to realize the resulting photos themselves could be his work. Thus born was his series of evaporating dry ass cubes in 69, and he subsequently added his own motions and the heavenly movement into his repertoire. In Japan, this was the beginning of one strain of photo-based conceptualism in which an artist functioned as both an agent of expression in its first life, life as well as in second life, merging them as his work. In the wilderness, the key figure is Horikawa Michio, a lead member of GAN, known for event to change the image of snow in 1970. A memorable landscape color abstraction on the snow, this work was a hybrid of anti-art and non-art. It resulted from the collaboration between a photographer, Hanaga Mitsutoshi, who contributed the anti-art media strategy, and GAN members who devised a performance in the less body-oriented mode of non-art. Separately from the collect this collective act, in his individual work, Horikawa too became an observer of things around the same time in 69 with Nomura, but without knowing his work. Horikawa's experiment with information as the second life began in July 69, when he devised mail art by sending stones, inspired by the Apollo 11 mission that brought back moon rocks to Earth initially conceptualized as a male happening. Both Nomura and Horikawa set an inanimate object into motion. While Nomura's dry ass cubes would disappear over time, Horikawa's stone would leave his hands to be delivered to remote addresses by postal mail. Either way, the artists were conscious of the need for documentation. From the beginning, Horikawa was very methodical in collating the related information as documented by this data card that document his first mailing in July 69, consisting of the list of recipients, photographs, and artist statements, and such. In his first mailing, he realized he might incorporate responses from the recipients, like postcards, notices, and some more elaborate communication from the recipients into his data card. This in turn led to a scheme for his second mailing in November 69 in conjunction with Apollo 12. He obtained receipt from the cutting and mailing of 12 stones and pasted them on his data card. Using these cards, 
the orchest he orchest orchestrated a face-to-face -face exchange scheme with the recipients by asking them to countersign the cards to acknowledge his mailing when he visited Tokyo and then happened to see them there. In doing so, he extended the second life of his mailing, created a chain of interactions. His mail art was recognized by the critic Nakahara Yusuke, who invited the young artist to show in Tokyo Biennale 1970, to which he sent 13 stones in conjunction with Apollo 13. Notably, in the beginning, Horikawa did not feel that this data card would constitute his work as such. It changed in December 69, when he was invited by two art students, Ina Kenichiro and Takeda Kiyoshi at Tokyo Zoke University to participate, participate in their seminar project, Psycho, uh, Psychophysiology Research Institute. The project requires the invited participants nationwide and one international participant to perform an act at the specified date and time and make a report on it by sending related information to the Tokyo headquarters of Ina and Takeda, who would collate their copies for circulation. To conclude their project, Ina and Takeda published an artist book consisting of data card, as shown on screen. Significantly, they mixed performance art and mail art by focusing on the information generated by the act by participants, which ranged from photographs to diagrams to texts. In the discussion of Psychophysiology Research Institute, we need to reference Onkawara's postcard series, I Got Up, which was shown in 69 in Tokyo at the Biennial Mainichi Contemporary Art Exhibition but I will skip this here today. The idea made Horikawa realize that his data cards did constitute the work, not just documentation. Collating photographs and related data of an act is routine practice among such Euro-American conceptualists as Dennis Oppenheim and Vito Aconci. Comparison of Horikawa, Nomura, and Oppenheim Aconci is instructive. Both Nomura and Oppenheimer Conchi created their works for their receptive marketplaces, respective marketplaces, institutional and commercial, while realizing the scale comparable to large painting. In contrast, Horikawa didn't think of marketplace of any sort, so he did not alter the size of his data card. Horikawa's data card contains the similar kind of information as Oppenheim's, but it may likely appear mere documentation to many eyes. So that's the uh, approximate the uh, size comparisons. Oppenheim's work is really big, 152 centimeter high, whereas uh, Horikawa's uh, card is really small, like, you, like this. Interestingly, Horikawa would later apply the idea of the second life as a work to Gan's event to change the image of snow. In the mid 80s, he took control of its information, that is photographs taken by Hanaga, by obtaining from the photographer the production and exhibition rights. He then presented them in exhibitions and eventually produced a portfolio of inkjet prints in 2009, thereby achieving the commodification of his group's performance art. Another intriguing case of the Second Life captured in Psychophysiology Research Institute is the textual contribution by Matsuzawa Yutaka. We customarily envision the information of performance art in the form of photography. Take, for example, there is no photo documentation from Kazekura's minimalist act of falling down from the chair in the late 50s, or no photograph for the Kyushu Ha member Miyazaki Junnosuke's daring all night hole digging on the beach of Hakata in 62. Without photo documentation, their works have so far remained footnotes to the history of performances, despite their ingenuity. If we come to think of it, 
Photography is a relatively new technology dating back merely to the mid 19th century. Before photography, history, which, was, which is a compilation of performative acts, so to speak, was recorded not by photography, but by post hoc accounts by participants or observers. That is to say, through words and texts. Even where we have photography, captured images are not enough or sometimes not even accurate without discursive accounts. In that sense, sense, textual documentation is no less important in considering the second life of performance art. Matsuzawa's e-material conceptualism, which he slowly developed since the 50s, took a decisive turn when he had a revelatory episode that prompted him to categorically renounce objecthood of art in June 64. From then onward, Matsuzawa solely embraced the power of canon meditative visualization to unleash the viewer's faculty of seeing the invisible with the mind's eye. Text he, text he offered as his work served as an operation manual for the mind. Invisible things that he offered to the viewer included several imaginary exhibitions that he organized, beginning with his landmark Independence 64 in the wilderness. The text for his imaginary exhibitions initially served as announcement, which would become documentation only after the exhibition dates. The two texts Matsuzawa contributed to Psychophysiology Research Institute both documented his acts and acts after the fact. With the second one, he extended his imaginary engagement when he physically gave a guerrilla performance in a gallery assigned to him at Tokyo Biennale 1970 at the Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum. This is the gallery, which was kept empty uh, with two panels placed at the entrance at the uh, at to opposite ends of the room, and then this is his work. Let us read the text contributed to Psycho Psychophysiology Research Institute. Real and imaginary of Matsuzawa Yutaka at May 10, 1970 noon. The real I had one of an unspecified many people touch my heart in my room of my own death at Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum in order to anticipate my own death which I presented to Tokyo Biennale 1970. The person's fingers were trembling. The imaginary eye scooped one each heart from beneath her round breasts in an ancient cave of Nanashima Yashima Highland of Nagano Prefecture and let them fly into the milky mist outside the cave. Two photographers, Hanaga Mitsutoshi and Otsuji Kiyoji documented the physical acts undertaken by the real Matsuzawa with Buto dancer Tsujimura Katsuko, witnessed by the artist Yamaguchi Katsuhiro. But the imaginary Matsuzawa and his performance can only be visualized through canon by the viewers based on his text, which serves as an instruction. The dual use of text and photography typifies Matsuzawa's performance in this period. Another important work, his performance with Banner of Vanishing was inaugurated in October, 1970, privately at Mount Misa near his residence in Shimosua in central Japan. It was photographically documented by Hanaga Mitsutoshi and textually documented as the first in his monthly postcard painting series between 1970 and 71, which indeed documented his various activities, both private and public over one year. With Matsuzawa, the binary of real versus imaginary frequently parallels that of public and private. His secret ritual with Banner of Vanishing of 1970 was followed by a public one in 1971 at the Mainichi newspaper's domestic biennial, which inaugurated the lifelong performance series with the banner. If Horikawa as a member of GAN appreciated the value of publicity, Matsuzawa evidently eschewed 
it since it was sensory byproduct of material civilization that he had rejected as the fine, fatal mistake of mankind. Furthermore, Matsuzawa made no effort to control the photographic information, leaving it under the care of the photographers. Despite the growing tendency of taking control of photographic information, a desire to turn it into a work as such was weak among artists in the wilderness. This is true, even with the prey, a collective in Osaka specialized in the annual summer project of making voyage into landscape. With their first project in 68, voyage happening in an egg, the prey was cautious with the mass media and avoided over, overly sensationalized, sensationalized attention. Instead, from this first collaboration, the prey devised their own system of circulating information, both textual and photographic, rather than relying on, relying on the mass media. They produced posters and reports whose exquisite graphic aesthetics makes them work on their own light. In fact, in the history of performance art in Japan, the prey is the most accomplished and extensive in their information operation, complete with four volumes of monographs. Yet to this day, the prey seemingly regard their photographs no more than information, leaving the display of photographic images in exhibitions to curators. One may ask, did no Japanese artist think of creating a work based on his or her performance photo photographs like Vito Akonchi or Bruce Nauman did? An answer was almost. In the theoretical experiment of Hikosaka Naoyoshi, whose floor event occupies a distinct place in the history of performance art. In fact, Hikosaka began floor event as a photographic project. A lead theorist of Bikyoto or Artist Joint Struggle Committee, the young artist in effect confronted, confronted three conundrums that had explicitly and implicitly haunted and still haunts performance art and its relationship with photography. Whose photos are they? How to gain publicity or circulate information? Is it photos of a performance or a work of art? His solution was photograph himself in action and circulate resulting photo as uh, information art. In this way, both his act and photos are his works. In October 1970, Hikosaka set up a 35 millimeter cameras in his backyard so that the camera could capture his room in full view and his act of pouring latex liquid rubber on the tatami floor. Since he could not press the shutter himself, Tone Asunao, a Tokyo Fraxus member and his mentor, did so on behalf of the young artist over the course of the next 15 or so minutes. Hikosaka's plan was to select some frames, print them, and display the prints in the same room as his solo exhibition for the Kyoto Revolution Committee's solo exhibition series planned for 1971. If only Hikosaka had followed through, his, uh, followed through with his initial plan, we would have a great example of self-documented performance art. In reality, Hikosaka did not. What you see on the screen is the compilation of the vintage photographs recently found in his photo archive. In reality, Hikosaka became interested in the changing surface of latex on the tatami floor and recognized the self-evidence of the floor was phenomenologically bracketed by the latex skin. He went on to explore the theoretical nature of self-evidence by producing variations of fly event for the next five years. In this project, photography remained documentary, even though Hikosaka made sure to maintain the control of images as his own like other performance artists in Japan abroad began to do, including the prey. Thank you. This is the end of my lecture. 
Thank you so much, Reiko Sensei. I think it was very, very interesting. And well, now we have some time for a Q&A. So uh, I will be reading questions if, if we have any in English and Spanish. Uh, let me switch to Spanish. So, uh, si alguien tiene alguna alguna pregunta, eh, nos encantaría eh, pasársela a la doctora Reiko. Eh, we, we have some comments like eh, excellent, we love it, very Thank interesting. You. Thank you. Thank you. Pero si alguien tiene alguna, alguna pregunta, pueden aprovechar ahorita si no entendieron algo de algún performance, si quieren que hable un poco más de alguna de las cosas que eh, se hablaron en la eh, conferencia del día de hoy. Uh, we are receiving some comments. Uh, ¿Alguien alzó la mano? Perdón, si puedes volver a alzar la mano, si quieres decir tu pregunta. Mm. Uh, for example, uh, um, yeah, I think, yeah, we have one question, uh, two questions, wait a minute. Um, okay. Mm. Uh, dice José Alberto eh, que no tiene micrófono, entonces si quiere... Eh, voy a decir su comentario más bien en vivo. Yes, so, eh, José Alberto is mentioning in the comments that eh, this performance at, eh, art represented a lot of, of rebellion in, in his uh, way of, of perceiving it. Uh, so, he is asking hmm, If these kind of performances from 60s and 70s are still like um, valid nowadays, I mean, like uh, if artists in Japan still do that, uh, I mean, in design and, and current production. So that, that's his question. Uh, so the uh, question is, uh this kind of uh, radical rebellious uh, acts from 60s and 70s still uh, continue, uh, today's artists continue to do it? Mm, yes. Oh yes, okay. That's a very uh, interesting question because the, in a way, even in art, like fashion, things changes. And then, uh, especially in art, and in many forms of cultures, new is always good. You know, everybody wants to do something new and then new. Uh, it is not easy to create a new. So the, uh, uh, the, uh, the nude is not so prevalent as today, I think, but the uh, engaging you, you meaning uh, us, like uh, the uh, audience or public members became more active, more, more prevalent. So the uh, like uh, sometimes artists can serve a food, you know, like a soup or something like that. And then even like uh, nowadays, the uh, performance art is not the matter of wilderness. They, we, we can see performance art all the time in the museum. And then, uh, so the, uh, the point is the uh, like, uh, uh, there are two things. I think the important point is to uh, point out too. One is that the art is not something an individual person makes and then create an object and then uh, it, it, it and then usually it's done. Like a painting is an artist creates a painting and then you put it on the wall and it's done. We go there and then appreciate it, but not really interact with it. Uh, with performance art, artists have to create, perform it often the time in front of you, or sometimes with you, and you are not the dispassionate, objective audience, but you sometimes get you know, very emotionally involved, or actually you know, interact with them. And then so like, you know, there are no boundary, very little boundary nowadays between artists and audience. And also what can seem art, and then what can seem not art, also, 
not so, you know, uh, the uh, distinct. And that is a very radical thing compared to the 60s, actually. 60s, we are, uh, artists are still trying to figure out what they can do. And then like, uh, it's very uh, scary, actually. And then also the, uh, nobody pay attention. Very little people, few people uh, you know, pay attention. Now we are paying all the time attention, all the time. We are so curious, we are so involved. So yes, I think the rebellious uh, acts continues, but the, their nature changes over the time. And then it became more interesting and fun, I think, nowadays. Okay, thank you so much for your your answer y muchas gracias por esta pregunta. Uh, I will continue with a question from Yesit Caldero Rodelo. Eh, voy a continuar con el, la pregunta de Yesit que dice, quisiera saber si las vanguardias artísticas del siglo XX impactaron al arte de performance de Japón de los años 60-70. Now I, I will read it in English. Yesit is asking, I would like to know if the avant-garde movements, I, I, I think she refers to a Western avant-garde movements of the 20th century impacted the performance art of Japan. That's also a very interesting uh, question. And actually it's a very important question because uh, we have a tendency that, you know, like, uh, may I say Mexico as well as Japan is more much uh, on, the, on the periphery, on the margin compared to the Paris or New York. I think we can say that. And then, uh, and then so like, you know, always the uh, interesting things or avant-garde things and then innovative things happens in New York or Paris. And then that will be transmitted to us, Mexico or Japan. And then we say, oh, that's interesting. We can, we want to do that too. And then that's what you, uh, you know, impact and the influence and then those things. Interesting thing is the performance art, actions and acts and rituals and events that you saw, uh, I showed you today, almost in parallel development. And then sometimes it's much, much earlier. I showed you, maybe I can, uh, I showed you the uh, Gutai's performance, uh, the acts. Uh, like uh, the challenging the mark. This is a 55. Uh, the, uh, hold on, I'm getting there, getting there. Yeah, uh, this is me. So yeah, okay. So this is the, uh, uh, the uh, his uh, Shiraga's uh, uh, the action, uh, challenging mark. This is 55. If you th think about it, 1955, nobody, use the body in this way in public. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, if Krein's anthropomorphic, uh, the, in which uh, he threw around the uh, women's body with a paint, uh, uh, the, with paint and then to paint the public, uh, make a paint, public painting, that's the later 50s, 50s, but later. And then uh, Alan Karprov, who is the uh, credit as the, uh, the, uh, the originator of happening, actually was very upset when he learned of what good I did in the mid fifties because they were well ahead of it and then so on and so forth. So, and then even in the sixties, the, uh, I showed you the uh, cleaning event uh, like, uh, did I have the cleaning event? Cleaning event, the artists are cleaning uh, the street. Okay, I'm sorry, I had to find it. The, uh, okay, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? Oh, here. So this is 64. This is at the time of Tokyo Olympics. And then because the, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government was so intent to make Japanese, uh, the city clean, 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 for foreign tourists who come visit to see the, uh, the Olympic games. So the, uh, there are major campaign going on. So the Highland Center decided to critique, mock them to, with the, uh, this uh, ridiculously strange, uh, meticulous 
cleaning using toothbrush and then like uh, the broom for the uh, like, uh, you know, like a tatami room, very delicate tatami room. So the, uh, this is 64. Uh, the Fraxus group in New York was so impressed by this. So they actually recreated that in 66. So the, uh, in a way, lots of things are happening. If simultaneously, like uh, the naked uh, happening, like uh, that's a, a sum in New York, yes. So it's almost, yeah, you know, contemporaneous. And then uh, Yoko Ono's case, she was uh, going back and forth, uh, you know, like uh, New York and then uh, the uh, uh, Japan, but the, uh, it is in Japan, she created her signature piece, cut piece. A uh, cut piece is uh, probably, this is uh, better known among the Japanese artists work. She uh, uh, sat on the uh, stage and then the audience come one by one and then uh, cut out pieces of her clothes until well, she looks almost bare. And then this is, this she started because in Japan, she was criticized by male critics that women should be shit, silent and pretty. So she decided to sit silent and pretty because she actually wore the best dress she has, you know, like a Sunday dress so to speak, and then like, you know, offered her to be cut out. Uh, so it is a real feminist act, but the, uh, I don't know if she would have done that in New York, started in New York, because in New York, she was much, much freer, you know, being an individual artist with, um, you know, mingling with a uh, male and then female artists. Only in Japan, she could have done that because it's a very, uh, patriarchal society. So the uh, things works out very interesting way. So yes, the uh, Western uh, avant-garde did impact in some cases, like Shinohara uh, uh, was in, uh, inspired by Parisian painter who did action painting in the public, but overall it is rather, uh, uh, unique, unique, original, the uh, uh, em uh, emergence in Japan. And then that actually makes, uh, that's one of the elements, factors uh, that make uh, 60s Japan as a very important place to study in world art history. Thank you so much, uh, Reiko Sensei. I will move forward with mm -hmm. another question. Uh, first, I will read it in Spanish. Natalia Perea Hernández pregunta, eh, buenas noches, mi pregunta es, ¿las fotos vulneran de alguna forma el arte de los artistas? Puesto que en sí mismas, si así lo quiere el fotógrafo, podrían ser más que fotos informativas del arte. Now I will proceed in English. Uh, do pictures infringe in any way the artist art, given that pictures themselves could be much more than just informative picture of art if the photographer wants so. Yeah, that's a very good point because the uh, in any live event, not just performance art, being there yourself witnessing that event doesn't mean you know everything. Actually, you don't know much about it. You only see what's happening in front of your eyes. So like uh, if uh, think about the history, like, you know, if a revolution is happening, it's really difficult to get the entire picture just by seeing. And then so like a photograph is yes, very important and informative uh, tool to document uh, the, uh, the event. But the, uh, the problem is, photograph lies too. People lies, of course, we know that, but the photographs lies too. Do you know the famous uh, Iwo Jima, uh, the, the capture of Iwo Jima picture? 
It's the uh, Iwo Jima is the uh, Jap occupied by Japan, and the American military came to uh, took it back. And then uh, on the Suribachi Mountain, Suribachi Yama, it's uh, there's a you know peak uh, on which American soldiers put uh, uh, put up the uh, American flag. The point is, the first time they put it up, nobody was around to photograph it. So the soldiers had to redo it for the photographer. So the, uh, yes, uh, pictures are informative, and uh, but uh, sometimes it lies too. And then also, no matter how many pictures you take, it's not complete. You know, often the time, if you take a good picture, all the other information kind of leshes, all the other details leshes, like, uh, we saw the a very iconic cleaning event, you know, horizontal picture. Everybody is doing something with the uh, wearing the white lava cross, and then the passerby, that's a salaryman, you know, the uh, wage worker, uh, passing by like, oh, what's going on? Well, I'm busy. I have to go. I actually saw the contact sheets, meaning uh, the. 35, 35 millimeter negatives was the, uh, uh, the, the, the printed, you know, uh, uh, contact. So like you can see the whole row, what he took. Amazing thing is, one, that, was, that, that scene was not staged. That was captured by him. Do you know why I think so? Because, ah, uh, well, in part because the photographer told me so, but the, also the contact sheet, there are lots of uh, miscellaneous scenes. He's uh, shooting a close up, and then, uh, you know, sometimes close up three uh, consecutive close ups, you know, similar, but, you know, like a slightly different. That's, you know, photographers, uh, what photographers do. Cha -cha 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 -cha. And then probably one of them would be good. In that, the uh, one uh, roll of 35 millimeter, that usually like a 30, uh, 30 to 40, 36 exposure, sometimes you can get 40. But anyway, only one is that iconic scene. Had he direct the artist to shoot that scene, he would have uh, used probably the whole entire row. That's what the photographers do too. But there's only one frame among all these. So that's genuine. I was so surprised. I, 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 I kind of, it's not a good uh, practice as a historian because I took the photographer's word as it is because he said, I didn't stage it. Okay, if you say so. But I actually saw the uh, contact sheet. I checked the contact sheet actually last week. And I was like, it's real. I now know it's real. So the, uh, yes, in that sense, photography pictures are very informative too. So it goes both ways. Thank you so much, Reiko Sensei. Uh, now I have a, another question here. Uh, I will read it first in Spanish. ¿Alguno de estos artistas fueron llevados presos por sus performances? Um, the question is, were any artists ever arrested by the police for their performances? Ah, well, the, uh, let's keep talking about cleaning event. The uh, cleaning the streets that way, it's a public space, right? So the, it is actually illegal, not lawful. If you, nowadays, if we do that today, we go, we uh, make a application to maybe police office or maybe city hall, I don't know which department, but you know, so we get permission to use the street, just like the uh, movie location shoot would uh, get the permission from the city hall. You know, so the, then it's legal and then you, you have to follow the uh, regulation then. Uh, with the uh, uh, anti-expo people, ritualist people, uh, when the, uh, uh, that the uh, kind of conflated with the anti-war student movement, yes, uh, once uh, the, uh, they were arrested. 
And then uh, that was actually mm, rather shocking event because usually artists like a cleaning event, if they felt uncomfortable enough, you know, if you stay longer, you know, it, exposure is bigger. You know, the uh, possibility of getting uh, caught is bigger. So the, uh, they will run away. It's a clandestine event. That's a guerrilla event. They know that. So they know when to run. Actually, knowing when to run is a part of performance art in this case. So the, uh, yes, there were instances of being arrested, but the, uh, uh, that's uh, really when the, uh, the, the, the performance acts became activism, protests. Then they kind of cross the line and then gets arrested. Thank you, Reiko Sensei. Eh, Ángel Enrique Arias Arenas pregunta si la relación entre los fotógrafos y los artistas fue única en Japón o eh, si fue como algo internacional. Um, somebody is asking us if the relationship between photographers and artists was a unique thing in Japan or was it a, a common way internationally speaking? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, when I said the uh, relationship between photographer and artist in the performance that is contentious, it's all over the place because the uh, initial, uh, like, uh, you know, I talk about Fraxas before. So Fraxas, uh, there was a few photographers, uh, professionally, professional photographers following them. And then that, of course, they are professional photographers, so they keep the, uh, their photographs. That's their work. And then like uh, Fraxus artists, when they have an exhibition and such, they have to pay the uh, copyright fee. They are very upset about it because they, without them, there is no, that, no photograph, but the, uh, they let the photographer photograph it. And then they actually benefited it from that because the uh, if you are actually in the in acting uh, in action it's very difficult to organize everything and then in that way photographer and artists and especially like underground photographers who, who are close with artists they work together the only thing is when uh, artists became a little more famous above ground so to speak and then having exhibitions and then like the curators ask, so what did you do on the street? Oh yes, I did and this and this and this and they, oh, so-and-so uh, have a picture. Let's uh, borrow that. And then no, 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 no. You cannot teach the borrow. So the, uh, yeah, it, it is, uh, you know, issue. And then, so the, uh, like uh, I brought up the Akonchi and the Oppenheim, they were actually early example of artists taking control of photographs and other information and then present it to uh, the public as their work. So the, uh, it's, uh, you know, like uh, when things are happening, like I said, you know, in the 60s and 70s, it's a very early time. Artists were beginning to work in a new area. So there's always the uh, trial and error. And then like, uh, it's, in that way, it's very different from like today. We will never have that problem today because the, everybody's roles are so well defined. And then almost there is always a, like a you legal know, contract or something, you have to sign it. Thank you, Reiko Sensei. So uh, I will move forward. Um, alguien nos pregunta, ¿el arte performativo se institucionalizó? Se marcó alguna línea a seguir para presentarlo. The question is, uh, was performative art ever institutionalized? Well, uh, was there a certain met method or guideline ever established to be followed for its representation? Yeah, that's uh, another headache we have. Uh, uh, I think uh, the the when you say institutionalized, nowadays you can see performance art at the museum, like uh, 
Marina Abranovich. She had a big uh, retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art, and then like a nude models are actually walking around in the uh, galleries, and then like you know, and then she enacted one uh, one of her stealing piece in a big at atrium, and then so on and so forth. So yes, it is institutionalized. It became uh, you know part of our contemporary art practices. So the uh, there are you know like a kind of know hows of how to you know show it. And then also how to preserve or how to document it. And then that's uh, you know, where we still are debating what is the best way. The uh, photography nowadays are shown like from 60s and 70s, photographers are always credited and then like artists are credited and then how to pre uh, present, you know, but the, uh, this is still ongoing debate. Okay, we we still have a few questions. I I would um I would ask two more okay. if it's okay with you because yes. apparently it's a very interesting topic in here in, in Mexico. Um, Marisol Espinosa pregunta: ¿Nos podría hablar más del performance donde pintan la nieve? Uh, so uh, the question is. Could you ask, sorry, could you talk more about the performance you mentioned about changing the color of the snow? Oh, that's a gorgeous thing. I love that <laughs> work, yes. So the, uh, now it's, uh, okay, so Japan is a small country, but the, uh, it's a uh, long, uh, you know, lat latitude wise uh, from north to south and then, uh, that's uh, the area of Gan is called Niigata. It's the uh, known as the heaviest snow country, one of the heaviest snow countries. So the uh, during the winter, like from uh, November to March or even April, they are snowed in, and snow in Mexico you may think it's a fun thing, you know, like a Christmas, white Christmas, like, and then like a kids are doing a snowball fight and then like a, you can make a snowman and so on and so forth. In the snow country, a serious snow country, the uh, snow is a killer. Snow destroys your house if you don't remove it from the, uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the roof, snow could, in, uh, uh, snow hinders your traffic. It is really not nice thing to have. So snow is not a happy thing. Snow is a grooming thing in Niigata. So the artist Gan, group the Gan wanted to change the image of snow people have, ordinary people have about snow. They want to make a happy scene. So they thought about lots of things. They thought about hiring a a uh, small airplane or helicopter to uh, the, uh, spread the uh, color pigments. Well, obviously that costs money, so they decided not to do that. And then, uh, so the, uh, they thought about lots of different ways. And then finally, another interest, uh, important aspect of Japanese landscape is there are lots of rivers. And then rivers usually in Japan have lots of big uh, dry river beds. So under the snow, it becomes a huge field covered by snow. So you have a great canvas there. So the, uh, they, uh, they actually worked with the uh, paint company uh, in Tokyo and then uh, the art-minded executive donated the uh, big amount of uh, uh, pigments, four colors, uh, you know, red, yellow, blue, green, and then those pigments. And then they put that in the uh, pesticide sprayer from uh, the farmer use. And then they just spray paint uh, the, uh, the, the field. Uh, the uh, good thing about liver is there's one more good thing about the river is there's a bridge. Bridge overlooks the dry riverbed. That's an ideal vantage point for the photographer. 
So the, uh, you don't need the airplane or helicopter. You can just go to the bridge and then look down and then photograph. So the, that's a great photograph and then great painting. And then I love that work too myself. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Reiko Sensei. So I, I would like to, to end this Q&A with uh, Aleida Gomez question. Um, she is asking, well, eh, ¿qué bibliografía recomendaría para introducirse en el mundo del arte performático japonés? Uh, in English, uh, she's asking, which literature would you recommend to get an introduction to performance art produced in Japan? And mm -hmm. I, I, I maybe would add in English, maybe, or yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. Spanish, I suppose. Uh, Impossible. I, I don't, <laughs> I, I, I don't, uh, there are a few uh, the books, uh, exhibition catalogs in the past, the, uh, 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 that includes Japanese uh, performance art. Uh, the, uh, the Hirata Minoru, the one of the art in action photographer, he has a small monograph. So the, uh, his uh, uh, photo book is very good source to know the, uh, uh, the, what kind of, you know, visually, you know, you can understand what, what uh, Japanese artists did. Uh, Otsuji Kyoji is another photographer who also had the uh, photo books, uh, you know, the, uh, the archive is uh, turned into a photo book uh, in Japan, so that's also useful. Uh, the, uh, unfortunately, the best book is in Japanese. Uh, some, some of that, uh, the by Kuroda-san, I showed you on the screen, and then uh, that's a good one. Uh, some of the things uh, the, uh, I, I discussed in my book, so that's uh, another good source for you. Uh, so the, uh, here and there, the, uh, often the time, there are major uh, exhibitions, uh, museum exhibitions outside Japan, like a Museum of Modern Art, or recently uh, in a Polish museum, also Japan Foundation worked with the Polish Museum to uh, create the 60s, major exhibition of 60s and 70s art. And then that has lots of uh, performance art uh, you know, included in it. So the, uh, we still need to, you still need to look, uh, make an effort to find it. Uh, unfortunately, there is no one single volume I can recommend. In, in English or Spanish. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Reiko Sensei. I, I, I'm really glad everybody participated and, and they had very interesting questions, I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thank you so much for your conference and your time. The topic was really interesting. And uh, I now I will switch to Spanish to, to say goodbye to, to everybody. Eh, bueno, creo que ya, ya se nos acabó el tiempo. Muchas gracias a todos por todas sus, sus preguntas, por todo su interés en esta conferencia. Y no me queda más que agradecer a todos los que nos acompañaron el día de hoy. Eh, por supuesto, al Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Monterrey, que es uno de nuestros colaboradores y que ellos eligieron este, este tema específicamente porque creo que va de la mano con su programa educativo. Les agradecemos muchísimo a, to a todos y esta conferencia está, eh, va a estar en nuestras redes sociales. Ahorita la pueden encontrar en Facebook y eh, también la van a poder encontrar en nuestro YouTube, la versión en inglés y en español. Pues muchísimas gracias y eso es todo por hoy. Los esperamos en las próximas conferencias. La próxima semana, lunes y martes, tenemos conferencia. Van a ser diferentes temas, pero todo girando en torno al arte contemporáneo japonés de los 60. Así que los, los esperamos y todo lo pueden ver en nuestro eh, Facebook de la Fundación Japón en México, arroba FJMEX1. Ahorita está saliendo en pantalla. Muchísimas gracias a todos.